Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you might be located today. And thank you for joining us. You know, to make this a little bit more interactive, take a minute to type into the chat box what state you might reside in, or perhaps what state you might be traveling to today. Let's see where people are being represented. We've got Georgia, we've got Minneapolis, we've got New Jersey, California, Illinois, quite a few, quite a few states here represented. Well, wonderful. Well, let's get started with some brief introductions. My name is Bina Thomas, Head of Strategic Partnerships at Let's Get Checked. I've been in the population health space for about 23 years, having spent uh, 10 years at Elevans Health, formerly known as Anthem, and uh, about eight years at Optum. And the last three and a half years here at Let's Get Checked as their head of strategic partnerships. I have the distinct pleasure of sharing the floor with two distinguished gentlemen here today. We've got Keith Anderson, who I've also had the pleasure of working with during my time at Optum, and Dr. Rob Morkin, who I currently have the privilege of working alongside of. Keith Anderson is COO and leads strategic initiatives at Optum and shared services across health solutions, a division of Optum Health. He focuses on identifying and cultivating new businesses and transforming existing businesses to meet the needs of the customers Optum serves. We have Dr. Rob Morgan, who we refer to as Dr. Rob. Dr. Rob is the Chief Medical Officer at Let's Get Checked and Chief of Urology at Virginia Hospital Center. He is regularly voted a top doctor by both Washingtonian and Northern Virginia magazines and has been a contributing editor for Men's Health Journal. Welcome, gentlemen. Yeah. Thank you, Bina. Thank you. Wonderful. So let's hear a little bit about who Let's Get Checked is and a very brief introduction here. You know, we've all had the privilege of having a front row seat watching the movement of healthcare shifting to one that's more convenient and in the home, i.e. telehealth, mail order pharmacy, at home testing solutions as we wrestled our way out of the pandemic. And Let's Get Checked as an organization is really a leading healthcare solutions company that provides consumers, employees, health plan members, tools to manage their health from the home with direct access to health insights, at-home diagnostics, genomics, virtual care, and pharmacy for a wide range of health conditions. Founded in 2015, the company empowers people with accessible health information and care to live longer, happier lives. Today, Let's Get Checked as a leader in healthcare innovation with an end-to-end -end model, including manufacturing, logistics, lab analysis, affiliated physician support, and prescription fulfillment, which provides this seamless user experience and really a convenient, reliable, and secure healthcare experience for individuals. Keith, if you wouldn't mind walking us through Optum and really how Optum is organized under United Health Group. Happily, and I'll try not to take the full hour just introducing Optum here. Um, at the highest level, Optum is the health services and the care delivery arm of United Health Group. So we are, we're big. Um, we touch over 100 million people with our services each and every year. And we have a growing physician network of over 90,000 physicians across the country. Um, relative to this conversation, Optum is the entity that offers preventative care services such as biometric screenings in office, as well as in the home, as well as various wellness programs. So at the highest level, that's Optum. Wonderful. So let's go over what we are gonna be spending the next 40 minutes or so discussing. We're gonna be highlighting a few key areas. The first being the current landscape in health and wellness. We'll also be discussing a bit about key engagement and cost saving strategies. We'll touch on a few case studies and discuss how outcomes based solutions and what these outcomes based solutions are in the market today. Lastly, we'll end with the Q&A. So as we take a look at the current healthcare and employee wellness program landscape, we know that in today's competitive business environment, 
organizations are increasingly recognizing the importance of prioritizing the well-being of their employees. And as a result, the employee benefits landscape has witnessed a significant transformation in recent years. And so as we take a look at this a little further, you'll see here the current landscape and why. Why do employers offer preventive care? Keith, if you could walk us through really some of the reasons of why employers even care. Yeah, happily. I mean, I think there are many reasons, uh, many of which are listed here, um, not the least of which is attracting and retaining talent. I actually want to focus on the last one, which is improving health outcomes. Employers, you know, myself included, we spend a considerable amount of time assembling the very best employee benefits that help our employees achieve what we call ideal health. Now, that could be ideal weight, helping somebody quit smoking, uh, or managing a chronic condition. But what often goes overlooked is how many employees or members or just people don't even know that they have a health problem to address in the first place. So in other words, oftentimes we're offering these great benefits, but they go unused because people don't think that they're actually the right candidate. So they're looking at these great benefits and they're thinking, wow, those benefits are great, but for somebody else. Uh, here's one stat that always comes to the top of my mind. 80 out of 115 million Americans with prediabetes or diabetes don't even know they have it. So to make my point even more clear, we spend a lot of time focused on what is a program to help hypertensive or diabetics or prediabetics? What are good benefits to help those members? But we don't oftentimes spend enough focusing on how do we let these employees know in the first place that they're actually the right candidates for some of this help. So for me, health outcomes starts with prevention and specifically preventative care screenings. I couldn't agree more, Keith. And you know, the concept of wellness in the healthcare industry, it's more than just a trend, right? I mean, it, it really is a rapidly advancing area of focus, not just for employers, but even for health plans and other segments of the healthcare industry. And, and again, thanks to a growing body of research, again, that Optum has done as well, linking employees' physical and mental well-being to business performance. So you're absolutely right when you talk about health outcomes. Dr. Rob, anything else you would add here? Well, in the spirit of conciseness, uh, I would uh, maybe say what, what Keith said. Uh, I really appreciate his comments around focusing on the idea of improving health outcomes. Um, and maybe even a little more succinctly to answer the question about why do employers offer preventative care? Uh, really because it's the right thing to do. Uh, in our current environment, where we know that uh, individuals obtain their health coverage or the majority of their health coverage from their employers and they look to their employers to be that, uh, that foundational component, um, it's the right thing to do. We need as a, as a society and certainly as a healthcare delivery system to migrate away from how we've traditionally operated, which is a very reactive healthcare system, meaning we wait until something hurts, until there's some major symptom, and then healthcare swoops in and begins to sort of uh, try to patch things up. We're kind of playing from behind a lot, uh, you know, ninth inning down by two strikes, and now we're trying to figure out how we're gonna get back to some level of health. Uh, the reason I've been so passionate about Let's Get Checked and what we've really been trying to do since the beginning is because I really feel that the power of what Let's Get Check can do is migrate all of that earlier in the cycle. In other words, let's find these issues before they develop, when they're very early infancies of developing, and be able to interact in ways, intervene in ways to keep people healthier, happier, living longer lives uh, at a much reduced cost, quite frankly, because we know that so much spend is when these disease states get fairly progressed and actually all already have symptoms. And so, uh, you know, it's the right thing to do. We can improve outcomes. It just requires focus and attention. Thanks, Bina. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Well, as we take a look at challenges, Dr. Rob, I'm wondering if you could walk through some current challenges in the well-being industry today. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, a lot of this is, was really highlighted by, by the pandemic. And I, I'm sure everybody on this call uh, remembers a moment in time during the pandemic 
when they weren't able to access things that would have traditionally been available to them, um, whether that you know be during the lockdown or uh, you know plans for travel. But certainly, if any of you uh, were in a scenario where you had to touch healthcare during that time, you realized that the pandemic dramatically impacted access. Uh, you know, hospitals, healthcare uh, facilities, physician offices, labs uh, did not want or couldn't have people in their facilities because of concern about spread. Patients themselves didn't want to go to those traditional environments because they were worried about getting infected. But the end result of all that, and this existed prior to the pandemic, was but was really highlighted during the pandemic, is that it delayed people accessing the normal routes and the normal cadence of medical care. Uh, and so the, the downstream effect from that uh, has been referenced in various places as, as a second pandemic, that because we didn't do the normal proper screenings during the period of the pandemic, we're now seeing and are going to continue to see sort of a second wave of these other disease states that otherwise would have been identified. Um, the good news out of the pandemic, if there is some, is that it really shined a light on the opportunity and the efficacy of migrating more and more uh, into a more virtual environment, more care into a virtual environment, a telehealth environment, uh, and really proved the model that, in fact, it was not just doable, but actually advantageous in many, uh, in many instances. Wonderful. And so, you know, here we have kind of a list of, of, uh, of top sort of spends uh, in terms of from a health, an employer standpoint, what are the types of conditions that tend to drive uh, the financial burden or burdens in healthcare? Um, none of these should come as a big surprise to anybody, but I'd highlight probably three, uh, three of them that in my mind really jump off the page. Uh, obviously the spend on cancer, uh, although cancer is at a high level, the second leading cause of death, uh, you can see the, the, the dollar amounts that, that uh, are assigned to managing cancer are tremendous. Uh, and this is one obvious area where if we can be doing the proper screenings and the proper detection earlier in the disease process, these numbers will go down because it is absolutely easier, more cost effective. If you wanna just talk dollars and cents, which as a physician, I'd like to not just talk dollars and cents, but if you want to boil it down to dollars and cents, uh, we can save money by treating early, detecting early, and treating early. The other two I would highlight, cardiovascular disease. This is the number one killer of cancer, or the number one killer of people in the United States, um, and, and a tremendous amount of spend there. So we impact cardiovascular health. We detect cardiovascular health earlier, keep people healthier earlier. We're going to decrease spend there. And then diabetes is another one because diabetes underpins pretty much almost anything else when you can consider disease state. Uh, you know, diabetes portends higher risk of cardiovascular disease, higher risk of cancer, uh, higher, higher risk of uh, uh, more, more surgeries, uh, just a whole cascade uh, of things, dollar spend on pharmacy, et cetera. So you know, those are three areas that I would certainly want to highlight. And again, ethically, it's the right thing to do, but if you want to boil it down to the dollars and cents and chase the money, uh, you can make a great case that doing the right detection, the right screening, and the right treatment earlier will save save dollars. That's exactly right, Rob. Keith, I'm wondering if you could perhaps give the audience an idea of how this might align with Optum's focus. Yeah, great question. Um, and obviously, at Optum, it's it's our job, and, and employers and, and payers rely on us to come to the table with solutions to help them help their employees manage these conditions. And so our, our focus is and always has been, we're trying to identify those members that have the most uh, complex, the most costly conditions, and just frankly, helping them figure out what to do, whether that's basic care coordination, so you take the you know, the top of the list here, cancer, recent cancer diagnosis, diagnosis. How, how do you help them, you know, manage through the medical bills, the administrative burden associated with, with uh, that cancer diagnosis, or if it's, it's helping with, um, you know, cancer clinical expertise, helping them find a center of excellence to know where they can have the greatest success rate 
in recovery. Uh, that is what we do. And building off Dr. Rob's comments, you know, as we try to help people with these conditions, given that you know care has been put off during the pandemic, uh, to use your analogy, we're, we're playing from behind even more now, right? We are trying to, the engagement problem has become, uh, there's, a, there's a bigger and broader light on how do we engage these um, employees um, even earlier, which wasn't, wasn't easy to do before the pandemic. So for us at Optum, um, we are thinking innovatively about you know, how do we adapt to the changing needs of our employee base and how do we adapt to what, what I think of as the, the new normal um, so that we can help employers help employees um, manage their conditions. And, but, you know, again, yes, we want to manage costs, just like Dr. Dr. Rob said. Um, but there's a lot of just, you know, more the right thing to do support that we can do uh, for employees, especially if we can get to them uh, earlier versus later. Yeah, that's exactly correct. Well, we've got a quick poll for our audience today here, and, and I see we have a number of employers and consultants that are on the line. What are your top cost drivers today? So you'll see responses, A, cancer, B, musculoskeletal, C, cardiovascular, D, diabetes, E, other. So if you all could take a, a, just a couple of seconds here to place your answer in, uh, mark your answer, and we'll see how folks have responded. Okay, let's see if we can get some of these poll results. So as you can see, cancer is number one here. We've got musculoskeletal and diabetes almost tying for second. We've got other for third and cardiovascular here as, or uh, let's see, yes, cardiovascular is last at about two and a half percent. You know, cancer care has become the top driver of large employers' healthcare costs to, due to an increase in late stage diagnosis, for example. We know the Business Group on Health have, have done quite a bit of uh, focus webinars and research on that and a new survey that was recently released. So not far from what we're seeing the research tell us. So let's keep going here. Let's take a look at this next section really is focused around key engagement and cost saving strategies. You know, consumerism is fundamentally about placing individuals at the center of the healthcare experience. It's enabling retail like choices and better decisions through access to personalized, relevant information. And now this becomes especially critical when we talk about engagement. We know that employee engagement is vital. It's a vital part of establishing a successful wellness program and failure to engage employees has also consequences. So let's walk through some key engagement and cost saving strategies here. Keith, if you wouldn't mind walking through some themes for improving preventive care and sharing how Optum encourages employers to approach wellness and maybe some of the themes that Optum have seen. Happily, I would love to, yep. So I, I'm gonna start with a little bit more of the basics, so nothing that you're seeing on this slide. Um, I think for us to prove, improve preventative care, um, we really need to recommit to closing that awareness gap that I talked about earlier. And by that, I mean do everything in our power to help the 80% of pre-diabetic -di members uh, know that they're pre-diabetic. Same thing for cardiovascular disease or any other chronic condition. I think back to when the pandemic hit and our business uh, for biometric screenings was largely done on site, you know, in, in employment offices. And obviously the amount of biometric screenings went down because people weren't coming into the office, right? Um, and so that totally made sense. But as I said earlier, we now have to adapt to the new normal. And so three years post, it's time to sort of re-engage, and what I'll say again is recommit to closing that awareness gap. So that's the foundation. If we're gonna improve um, engagement strategies with preventative care, we've got to address that awareness gap. Um, now specific strategies that I think of um, where are, that are pivotable, pivotal to improving 
success. Um, a couple things. Uh, one, think about what our employees need now that they didn't need then. One is they want optionality more than ever. So whether it's a biometric test, um, a wellness program, even seeing their PCP, employees want options. 10 years ago, doing biometric screenings in an employment office, and that being the only option, probably made sense. Um, but I don't know about you, the, you know, my office looks a lot different today than it did 10 years ago. And so again, we need to provide better optionality to them. So that means if we're offer, offering screenings, we want to offer biometric screenings, not only in the office, but kits for the home, PCP, ambulatory labs, all those options should be on the table. So one, optionality. Two, I will say employees are looking for, I'll say they're, they're demanding, uh, better usab usability. So the days of, of faxing results back and forth, I'm sure we all love our fax machines, uh, they're over. Um, waiting two, three weeks to see your results, over. Uh, and thank goodness. So I like to think about with, with our products and services, Optum, the, the more sort of archaic the usability, the, the lower the engagement. So usability is a, is a key theme um, and making it easier for our employees to use. And the last theme I'll say, and this is related to looking at the data and adapting, is the proper use of incentives. Preventative care just inherently is extraordinarily easy to put off. We've all done it. Um, and we know incentives increase participation. We know within Optum by a minimum 20 percentage points. Oftentimes incentives can double participation in uh, preventative care screenings. So providing the right mix of incentives is really critical for improving engagement in Excellent. Thanks, Keith. This next section, Dr. Rob, I'd like to turn to you if you're able to share with our audience a few engagement strategies and some statistics that we've pulled here. Yeah, thanks, Pina. So it may not come as a surprise to some of the people on this call that um, access to care, even if somebody wants to be engaged with their care, access to care itself, particularly in the traditional model, may be difficult, if not impossible, due to a variety of, uh, of factors, but one of which is certainly geography. Uh, we know we don't have enough physicians as it stands right now, uh, particularly in more rural areas. Uh, and that stress on the system is only gonna get worse. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but as the baby boomer generation ages, and in theory, then there is a higher requirement for healthcare services. And if we don't have more physicians or at least even enough physicians now, that problem is gonna become more pressed. Uh, so geography, I think, plays a major role here for a large swath of the population. Uh, you know, where I live in Washington, DC, um, where there is a plethora of physicians, it's still hard to find a doctor to get access, at least in a timely fashion, into their office. Uh, imagine what happens if you live in a more rural area. Not to mention the fact that as the American, uh, uh, as the um, American Hospital Association is quick to point out and is spending a lot of their lobbying time trying to address and raise awareness, rural hospitals are really, really strapped right now. They're closing at a very high rate. Those that have remained open are doing so by cutting back critical services and trying to reduce overhead. So again, geography is a big part of it. Uh, the other component I think in this highlighted here is that more and more traditional businesses have changed how they work so that the workforce going into an office, even if the, if the worker, the employee lived in a more rural area, they were still commuting to a central office or something, those days are over too, or at least have changed dramatically. And so as a result, you've got less people in centralized areas and more people that are dispersed. So you have to be able to reach those people. Uh, and again, that's where I think a model like we have at Let's Get Check is aimed uh, to succeed. We wanna be able to reach people where they are, when it's convenient for them to be reached uh, from the convenience, safety and anonymity of their own home, quite frankly. So, thanks, Pina. 
Um, we mentioned some of this earlier, but that you know a lot of people during the pandemic just either couldn't or didn't go get their sort of routine care, uh, skipped visits, delayed visits, et cetera. I see it every day in my own practice. Uh, it's just, it's amazing if you want to just look at it from a pure lab diagnostics. And, you know, if these are patients that have been seen every year for the past 20 years and they've got lab data, you know, they come every April 5th or whatever it is every year and they get their labs and they have their physician's appointment and they set their next appointment when they're walking out of the office, they set it up for a year later. And then you see this gap. And, you know, when the world shut down uh, in February of 2020, uh, there's this 18 month to maybe 24 month gap where these people were just not getting evaluated. And so, you know, we've mentioned it now on several different slides, but trying to play catch up. Um, the one thing I, I would point out, I know that at least in the poll earlier, the respondents, you know, talked about that they didn't see a lot of, uh, or didn't feel like there was a ton of spend on cardiovascular disease. Uh, I would argue that, well, that may be true in the day to day uh, when, the um, proverbial cardiovascular storm hits the fan, uh, the spend goes up dramatically. And uh, the reality is that uh, cardiovascular disease and uh, atherosclerotic disease is a silent uh, scenario. What's the greatest presentation for cardiovascular disease is heart attack and sudden death. Uh, and obviously we don't wanna be there. Um, so again, highlighting and not to beat a, a, a drum here over and over, but the idea is let's try to detect these things early when we can intervene correctly. Great. Keith, I'm wondering if you could walk us through this one, you know, really greater awareness driving engagement and what you have seen at Optum. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this is really intuitive, right? when people become aware of their health risks, they're more likely to do something about it. So yeah, when, when people are aware, they're twice as likely to engage in wellness programs, three times as likely to reduce their blood pressure um, and, and more likely to reduce their cholesterol risk. You know, interesting, I was looking back at our data from 2022. Um, so we did over a half a million tests at Optum and of the results, 37% of the member results came back with uh, a diagnosis of uh, that member being obese. 49% came back with that member having high blood pressure, stage one or two hypertension. And many of these, of course, people um, have both. So that means that about half of the people that get tested, they get these results and they think, whoa, you know, time to act. Um, so critical to the preventive care strategy is, of course, driving that awareness. But but I want to incorporate into that what this slide is saying is, is we have to have those services at the ready at that precise moment in which an employee gets those results because that is the moment in which they're most likely to act. Um, and that's exactly what this what this slide is, uh, is saying. You know. Excellent. Very good. Well, it looks like it's time for another poll here. So let's ask the audience, and this is an open-ended response, and we'll have the uh, responses uh, distributed later. What are your key engagement and cost-saving strategies? So if you wouldn't mind typing in your answer there, what are your key engagement and cost-saving strategies? We've reviewed several here uh, along the time our time together, but curious if there's other innovative ideas around engagement and cost-saving strategies. Okay, we'll keep moving here. Our next section really covers case studies. We know that case studies are a powerful evidence tool, and we're gonna spend a few minutes just highlighting a couple of these that we've uh, pulled together for you all. This is one that specifically speaks around colorectal cancer. Now, we do know that colorectal cancer is the second most common cause of cancer deaths among men and women combined in the United States. And screening is important because when found early, colorectal cancer is highly treatable. 
So while increasing colorectal cancer screenings, accessibility and awareness is the right thing to do for employees and their families, it can also help employers save money, reducing costs associated with things around treatment, absenteeism and productivity loss. So here you'll find an example of uh, an employer group in which there were about 20,000 eligible members and some of the results that we saw about a nine and a half percent positivity rate in the population, almost half, so about 50% projected decrease in mortality rate for those members that catch their cancer at an early stage, and then the projected ROI over five years. So a great case study we we're able to see here. The next one that I wanted to walk you through is a, a Fortune 50 employer and actually closer to a Fortune 10 employer. This is, this is an example of a national employer that we partnered with to deploy a biometrics screening program. And the program saw such success a couple of years ago that they relaunched it the following year and expanded it to include fit testing, colorectal cancer testing. And so to date this year, the program has helped over 20,000 employees. Now, really you'll see over on the left, 55% initial engagement, out of which we saw in the biometric section, 45% out of range cholesterol. And then for colon cancer screening, about 45% initial engagement with about 4% abnormal results. So again, you'll see the results kind of year after year. And it started out as just a biometrics testing campaign and then launched into the colorectal cancer testing campaign. So great results. So this next slide here, if you wouldn't mind, Keith, walking us through another case study, and this is specific to colorectal cancer testing. Yep, happily. And uh, this, is, this is my favorite. Uh, in that, you know, we're all we're all in this industry. We all do a lot to try and improve the lives of our employees, our our members, or whomever we work with. But it's really not every day that we can say, you know, we can tie directly our work to to saving lives. Um, but that was the case here. And so this case study is, is certainly one of my favorites. And it actually it happens all the time. So Lynette, in this case study, is interested in doing an in home test because let's be clear nobody wants to go in for a colon cancer screening um and you know unfortunately you know there were negative results or positive results and uh, the required intervention and and it's a result of the test that lynette was able to get treated early and you know her words um is firmly believes that as a result of this screening uh it saved her life um, it's really an example of exactly what we're looking for. One, we got to encourage screenings, um, often incenting to get people to participate. Two, creating that awareness. And certainly in a test like this, those members are going to take action. I think the keys to success here, um, when I think about all the things we've talked about thus far, was that optionality. And, and she had the option to do it in the convenience of her home as, uh, as opposed to going to you know, to a physician's office. So that's, that's that one. Beta. Excellent. Wonderful. Dr. Rob, I'm going to turn it over to you. This is we're nearing the end of our formal presentation, but if you wouldn't mind moving through some of the statistics that we have here at Let's Get Checked. Thanks, Bina. So I think it's important for the non-healthcare people on the call to appreciate that probably about 70% roughly 70% of all interactions that happen between a, a patient and a physician will result in some type of diagnostic test being ordered uh, and specifically uh, you know, with lab diagnostics making up a, a bulk of that percentage. Um, and what we've tried to do at Let's Get Checked is take that experience of lab diagnostics away from that stick bricks and mortar traditional go to the lab, find parking, wait in a crowded waiting room for hours, take that out of that system and essentially ship it and do it in the home. And these are self-collected specimens. We've worked really hard to build the functionality for an individual to self-collect the specimen, whether it be wet blood, 
uh, stool, urine, uh, cheek swab, depending on what test we're talking about. Uh, but we have a purpose-built, uh, high-complexity, CLIA and CAP certified lab that we own. We manufacture and assemble all of our own kits. Um, we've done all of the validation studies uh, and stand by the foundational principle that any lab test that somebody would do on our platform as a home self-collected kit or self-collected specimen, that those results will be clinically reliable and clinically actionable. Um, you know, the, the pandemic really um, obviously awful for everybody, but we were in, in some respects, the right place at the right time because we were able to really prove that the model not only works, but was critically vital. Uh, we, uh, at the height of the pandemic, were just in the just in the COVID space alone. We're running anywhere between ten and fifteen thousand COVID tests, self-collected nasal swab COVID tests a day through our lab. In addition to all of the other lab testing uh, that we do, we have uh, you know approximately one hundred and thirty different biomarkers that we offer. Um, we've done tens of millions of tests. Uh, we work with a large array of clients, Vina, you referenced some you know, Fortune 50, Fortune 10 companies, uh, federal and state uh, uh, plans as well in terms of uh, the government space. Um, we've detected a, a large number of lab uh, abnormal, abnormal results. We have a uh, medicine team, a physician team, clinical team of nurses, nurse practitioners and doctors to help support those clients. We own and operate our own pharmacy. So when uh, therapeutics are needed and appropriate, our team can actually uh, electronically prescribe and our pharmacy will ship directly to that uh, patient uh, their, their medications uh, where they want them sent. Uh, and we do all this with a really great client experience as reflected by the MPS. Um, you know, we uh, have always built our platform under the notion that there is a single individual user at the end of that experience. And uh, so client experience, patient experience uh, is of the utmost importance in every decision that we make. Thanks, Bina. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Rob. Well, that does end the formal part of our presentation. And now it's time to turn our attention to some Q&A. And we've seen some questions come through here. And I'll start with the first one. Dr. Rob, this might be one for you. Do at-home tests compare, how do at-home tests compare to those that might be administered in person and in a lab? Great question. Uh, and I think I, I sort of hit on that a moment ago, just uh, timely. Um, so as I said, we, all of our samples, all of our testing is done in a high complexity, clean cap certified lab. So all of our work the actual work is done on essentially the same type of instrumentation using the same type of technology that you would get in a more traditional lab. The difference is that we have purpose built that and purpose built our processes to work with small, small specimen size. Uh, so in other words, self-collected specimens, self-collected blood, self-collected stool, self-collected urine, et cetera. Um, and have then taken the, the step to do all of the necessary and appropriate validation studies to show that the results between the traditionally collected specimen and our model are very comparable. And so for that reason, as I said earlier, any test that's done by us, through us on our platform would be clinically applicable, no different than if you were doing this in you know, the hospital down the street in your physician's office or lab, et cetera. Excellent. We've got a few questions around incentive and incentive structures. Uh, Keith, I might turn to you. What incentive structure do you recommend to achieve engagement and what types of incentives might often be seeing to ensure their employers are prioritizing health and wellness and preventive testing? That's a great question. We could spend the rest of the time uh, on this particular <laughs> we topic. Sure can. Uh, we could. Um, you know, I will say we work with employers to choose an incentive plan that works for them. That's not a cop out. I mean, there 
there's multiple options. I will say incentives alone, um, you know, often double participation in screenings. Uh, even more impact, impactful, interesting is penalties. For some reason, human behavior, uh, we react even more to, to penalties, which drives upwards of 75% participation. There's also limits, meaning you can reach a certain incentive threshold where you stop getting engagement returns, even though you're dialing up the incentive amount. Um, the bottom line, and maybe to just keep it relatively succinct here, is incentives drive action, uh, especially in the area of preventative care, because preventative care is so easy to, to put off. Uh, I think incentives are incredibly important. Um, and what we do within Optum is help customize a program um, based on the data and the results that we have for each payer employer customer that we have. So hopefully that's just enough um, and I can leave it at that. Excellent, excellent. We've got one here on addressing social determinants of health, SDOH. How, what, let me see, what would you recommend in terms of engagement tactics or ways to address SDOH in a population? And I'll open it up to both of you. I'm happy so, to step uh, in. Quick. Yeah, go for it, Rob. Yeah, real quick, sorry. Um, you know, SDOH is a, is a real hot topic, hot term right now. Um, the federal government's shining a, a, a lot of uh, light and, and attention on that as well. Uh, I think the my short answer to that is uh, one of the great ways to do it is to, again, keep the idea that you can meet or try to meet a patient where they are when they want to be met. This is the idea of taking things away from a traditional system uh, that has created a lot of barriers for access, whether that be, be so, uh, you know, economic barriers uh, because of cost, whether that be geographic barriers just because of lack of access, which we mentioned in an earlier slide whether that be perhaps other biases that exist uh, intrinsically in the system around gender, race, uh, sexual orientation, et cetera. If you uh, can strip all that out by essentially saying, we're going to meet the individual, the member where they want to be met, safety, anonymity, convenience of their own home, uh, a lot of that goes right out the window. So we can ship a kit to anybody regardless of their gender, regardless of their race, regardless of their sexual orientation, and pretty much regardless of where they are in the U.S., we can get a kit to them. Our clinical team can access or can interact with them through either video or async chat, uh, and we can begin to provide care for them. So I think that's how you, that's how you do it, at least in my mind. Uh, but Keith, uh, sorry to step on you there, please. No, no I'm glad you went first. I, wouldn't, uh, and I, I won't repeat it. I think the, one of the things I would say is, is optionality. I talked about it earlier is um, the more options we give our employees or members, the better. Um, the other thing I would mention is just the change in the industry overall and in how historically we just over-focused and you know, singularly focused on physical health. You know, if you're overweight, you just, you know, you need some coaching on the weight. Um, if smoking, we need to get you on some medications, right? And, and now the whole world is, has changed. And what we try to do is focus on uh, social, mental, and physical health at the same time. And so most of the services that we offer today, contrasted with even four or five years ago, um, it, it's a blended solution. I don't think you can only address one of the three. And so we, we're building more tools in the toolboxes to make sure that if we're talking to somebody as an example about, you know, losing weight, we're simultaneously um, bringing out tools to address perhaps, you know, depression or, or eating disorders. Um, and, and so I just think it's more important that, especially as employers are evaluating what benefits uh, they want to offer to their employees, that they're challenging, uh, you know, potential partners to, to incorporate all three and not have three distinct, you know, separate offerings, uh, it should all be blended. Yeah, Keith, I think you've answered uh, another individual's question here, and I'll just read it out loud in case either of you have any further comments around this. What strategies can you recommend to get the unengaged to engage? We have a hard time with many employees who are set in their ways, quote, set in their ways, and it's a huge barrier to get them to participate. Mm -hmm. Yep, 
Um, well, I'll jump in on this one first. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not generally a huge incentive, um, a huge fan of incentives. Um, and, and, and when I am, I'm generally looking at incending outcomes as opposed to just activities. Um, but when it comes to preventative care, I am. And, and that's because you need to create a catalyst to change. You have to create a spark. And so uh, for that unengaged population, they often get up for, you know, for a certain dollar amount. Or, and, and I'll say it again, I think that, you know, penalties or taking sort of premiums away uh, is another way to, to incent action. Um, so incentives are certainly one of them. And then the other one being um, we can't rely on what we've done in the past. So that unengaged population, if you're hitting them every year with the same option of, hey, participate in this, and it's not happening, nothing's going to change, right? Um, and so new modalities uh, are the way to go because maybe they're not interested in participating in, you know, a very intensive weight loss program or going to their physician for something. Um, but much, but maybe they are, you know, it comes to their home. I think about you know myself, or just think of the United States. How much we can rely on the products and services that we have coming to our doorstep, right? Um, I'm sure I have two boxes on my doorstep today from Amazon, and and so I think that that we have to, to get to that unengaged. We have to give people more opportunities to whether it's get tested and drive that awareness, or to take action on their own terms. Uh, and doing that in the home. So kind of building on this to say one of our, our biggest strategies within Optum is how much of the benefits and services we provide we can actually do in the home given that's where consumer behaviors are trending. That's excellent. I've got a couple of questions. We'll just go through a couple of he these here. Years ago, we realized employees weren't using our preventive services, which went which we went on to assume this also means they don't have a PCP. Our primary goal with our wellness plan is to incent in individuals to get a wellness check by going to a PCP so they have one going forward. Is this an archaic goal? I'll jump on that one too. Um, yeah, I think, you handle that one. all right, it works for some populations, not all. But if I'm an employee and I don't want to go to a PCP, that's because I don't think I have a problem, right? I'm fine. I'm healthy. I don't need anything. And so that's why I go back to the importance of preventative care and screening, because maybe that employee that does not want to engage with, they don't want to take the time to find a PCP. Maybe they will if they find out that, you know, their, their cholesterol is through the roof or, um, you know, any other test result that, that is really that, that moment of, uh, or that spark, as I call it. So I, I again kind of go back to trying different things, but generally speaking, we would we would drive the behavior of getting screening first because, as I said, 50% of the results, and that's that's a loose number. Um, you know, people are going to come back, and there's going to be a little shock and awe with the results, and and that's really what we want to do is create a catalyst. From there, hey, it's time to get a PCP. Hey, it's time to um, you know engage with a wellness coach. So I, I think that might be uh, potentially, especially if you're having challenges, it might be a more effective strategy. Yeah, excellent. Here's one, a, a quick one, and this will end here, our Q&A. Do these kits get charged against the medical plan? And, and I can take this one. Our testing kits can be charged against the medical plan. Uh, that, that is not an issue. Oftentimes we are uh, invoicing the employer directly, but if it d does need to run through a medical plan, we work with the health plans to be able to run that through the health plan as well. So very good here. Well, listen, I want to thank the panelists, Keith Anderson and Dr. Rob Morkin, for the ability to have a conversation and for your engaging presentations. It's certainly been a great pleasure to be a, to share a small part of the stage with you today and certainly appreciate the time that you've spent with us. To the audience that's joined us today, thank you. We hope you were able to take away a few nuggets and you know, perhaps you can leverage some of this in your own respective organizations. I know I've seen a number of health plans, pharmacy companies, and employers and consultants on the line today. So hopefully there were a few nuggets for yourselves. So again, thank you and have a great day.